Good morning. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm glad that you are here. The Lord has a message for us this morning. It comes out of John chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11. I'll give you a moment to get there. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. I know, I know. We did a Wednesday night series on John that lasted seven months. And I said, we're going to take a break from John, and I think I've done good. If I'm not mistaken, this is the first time I've mentioned John on a Sunday morning since we ended that series last year. (laughs) I may have have referenced him, but I don't think I've quoted him. And I certainly have not preached a message that that has been the foundation of. But this morning, here we are. I had three different messages I worked on this week, and the Lord said this one. If you give your notes titles this morning, this message is entitled, Leaving Bethesda. Leaving Bethesda. Bethesda. Hope you've had time to find the scripture. John 5, verses 1 through 11. After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda in Hebrew, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a number of sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water, because an angel would go down into the pool from time to time and stir it. The first one who got in the water after it was stirred recovered from whatever ailment he had and one man was there who had been sick for 38 years and when Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been there a long time he said to him do you want to get well sir the sick man answered I don't have a man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up but while I'm coming someone goes down ahead of me get up Jesus told him pick up your mat and walk And instantly the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. And now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. It's illegal for you to pick up your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Let's go to the Lord. Father, I thank you today for the opportunity to be in your house. I thank you for your church and your people that you've gathered. I thank you for the work that you have already planned and ordained to be done in this place today. I pray, Lord, that our spirits and our hearts are aligned with it. I pray that I will speak according to your will, that your people will hear and receive according to what you've decided they need to hear this morning. And more than just hearing a good speech, more than just reading the word, more than just having gathered in this place, I pray that we leave here changed and better equipped to more effectively do the work of the kingdom outside of the walls of this building. Do your work in us today, Lord. Let your spirit have his way. Be honored by what happens in this place. This is your time. In your name we pray, amen. You've likely heard this story before. If you've been in church for any period of time, you've likely heard this. The angel comes down into the pool that the sick people lay around. Somebody tries to get in the pool. When the water gets stirred up, they get healed, they get well. Jesus happens upon this place in the course of his ministry and changes one man's life forever. In the same way that Jesus, if you meet him, will change your life forever and has no desire greater than to become involved actively in your life, wipe away your sins, make good on the promise. He just wants you to receive what he's already told you that he will do. Most of us, if you're listening to me, have had that experience this morning. But this message is for you. Why is this still for me? Well, it's not just a good children's story. It's not just a fascinating thing. It's not a script that would make a good movie. Here's what the Lord wants you to hear this morning. At some point, you have got to get up and leave the pool at Bethesda. When the Savior shows up, you've got to accept the call that comes with the cure. You have got to accept the call that comes with the cure. Jesus asks this man as he's been laying here for some period of time, do you want to get well? And I have preached the message about do you want to get well? You can go back and find it or maybe I'll re-preach it sometime. That's not the focus this morning, but I need you to hear the question so we can get where we're going. Do you want to get well? That question is not just about healing. That question is not just about do you not want to be sick anymore? Do you not want to be broken anymore? Do you not want to be poor? Do you not want to be fill in the blank with whatever your need is? That's not really what's happening here. The question is, are you going to leave behind what you have known for good? Do you want to get well is not just about be my fairy godmother and make this thing go away. Do you want to get well also comes with a commission that says you've also got to leave this place and stop behaving and living and identifying yourself with the thing that you have been saved and healed from. 
If you are truly a new creation in Christ, that is no longer who you are. Stop hanging out in that place. Stop being around those people. Stop living a life where people can't tell that Jesus has done something for you. At some point, you've got to leave the pool. We have to know what we're asking for when we ask God to move. People all over the world say, God, move in my life, move in my church, move in my house, come and do something great for me. And they want the Lord to do that in many cases without considering what it's actually going to cost them. It means they're going to have to leave the place of recovery and move into a place of ministry. 1 John 5, 14 says, This is the confidence that we have before him. Whenever we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We've got to know what we're asking because God's will for you is not just to fix what's broken. It's to make you effective for the kingdom. It's more than just he doesn't want you sick. It's more than just he doesn't want you poor. It's more than just he wants to make you comfortable and happy until he comes back. I've got horrible, horrible news for you. He doesn't care if you're comfortable. The Lord is not concerned with your level of comfort. If you'd like to test me on that, by all means, look at the lives of the apostles. All but one of them died an early death for preaching the gospel. And the one that didn't die an early death was tortured more than anyone that we read about in Scripture apart from Jesus himself. The Lord is concerned with the condition of your heart and soul and are you in right standing with him? And once you're in right standing, are you doing something with it or are you hoarding it in a silo out back to rot and doing nothing with it? The Lord is not going to give you a surplus so you can sit on it. It's not going to happen. You've got to get up and leave the pool. Examine yourself this morning. In fact, examine yourself any time that you go to pray to the Lord. If I'm going to sit down before him, am I praying according to his will? And am I prepared to do what comes with it? If I'm just praying for me, I don't need to pray that prayer. If I'm truly praying what the Lord has told me to pray, I've got to make sure that I am reconciled with the fact that something about me has to change. Something about me has to move. I can't sit here and just be happy by the water anymore. I've got a living water that's inside of me, and it will go with me where I go. I can't attach my happiness and my comfort to this pool. I've found a new happiness and a new comfort that goes with me. I've got to be ready to move with it. Examine yourself. Because if you're going before him to ask something that's not his will, it isn't going to happen. And if you're going before him but you're not willing to move, you're also going to find yourself lacking. Do you want to get well Jesus asks. This man has got to know the answer to this question because if he isn't prepared to leave, he isn't prepared to receive anything. If I'm not prepared to move from where I am, I'm not prepared to receive and carry and do with what the Lord would trust me to have. Yes, he wants you to be well, but what are you going to do with your health? Yes, he would like you to have enough finances to be able to take care of yourself, but what are you going to do with it when you have them? He would like you to do a lot of things. But if I'm not prepared to leave, I'm not prepared to receive it yet. And that's not a prosperity. That's not a blessing. That's not a fill me up and make me fat gospel. That is a practical application of what Jesus did with his ministry. There were plenty of people he wanted to receive from him. He preached to thousands of people. And when you look at the times that he fed 5,000 and he fed 4,000, when he left, it was still him and the twelve. There were a lot of people that came to receive when it was time to get fat because they were hungry, but not all of them followed him where he went next. I mentioned this last week, and I'm going to say it again. We've got to know where we are in relationship with the Lord because we can't make the mistake of thinking that just because everybody around us is getting blessed and we're getting the overflow of their blessing that we too are in good standing with Christ, the Lord says, do you want to get well? Because the Lord shows up and he brings all that stuff with him. And when a crowd of people that are blessed and anointed show up in a place, they bring a lot of that with them. They carry it with them. The Spirit is in them. The the blessing and the outpouring of the Spirit of God is on his people. And when you get a hundred of them or a thousand of them or even four or five of them, he says where two or three are gathered, I'm there. You get a group of them together, the people that are around them start to pick up on some of the blessings. Why? Because God's people do what they do. They, they bless people that are, that, are, that are poor, that are hungry, that are lonely, that are marginalized. It's what we're supposed to do is reach out to those people. We talked about that last week, the bare minimum. We do that. 
But just because you've been blessed by the Lord does not mean that you and the Lord are in right standing. You've experienced the goodness of God, but when the Lord looks at you and says, do you want to get well, you've got to know, am I just getting the overflow and the overspill, or are God and I good, and am I willing to do what those people did to get what they got? Am I really following him? If you're not prepared to leave, you're not prepared to receive. If the man by the well had been someone who really liked the attention, he's not equipped to just leave. He's not equipped to receive what God has and go on because he's going to be happy with those few hundred people that sit around that little well every day. They've become my friends. And when folks come by, they help me out because I'm in need and I'm poor and I identify myself with what's broken and empty about me. I have a disease. I have a sickness. I have, I, I'm unstable. I'm depressed. I'm poor. I don't have a house. I fill in the blank with whatever the thing is. And I'm surrounded by people who tell me it's okay and how to get through that. And then folks come by and they hand us money or they hand us food or they tell me poor baby and pat me on the head. If that's what you like, the condition of your heart has got to change if you truly want to receive something from the Lord. Because if what you like is the attention, you're going to find that what you will bring is a selfish and lazy attitude before the Lord, and he will not have the patience for it. What you will find is there's not a place for selfishness and laziness in the service of an almighty God. We don't get to just lay down and do nothing in the kingdom and say, I came for the meal. I'll just be sleeping here till the next one. You know what Jesus did after he preached on the hillside and fed 5,000 people? He had the disciples gather up the baskets and they left. They left. There was no next meal in that place where he provided and delivered and healed because Jesus was moving. The Spirit of God is moving. The purpose of God is moving. We preached this not too long ago. The kingdom of God is continually advancing and there is no end to its authority and its expansion. It's moving. It's getting bigger. We don't have the luxury of being lazy and sitting around and just doing what we can for me and saying, Lord, I need another batch. Can you come back? The Lord's moved three days, three years, three decades ago. Where are you? He told you where he's going. He gave you a roadmap. If you're praying and you're reading this, you know where he's at. But if you're just sitting waiting for the preacher to come feed you every Sunday morning or for the evangelist to come, come to town every September like the fair, that's not fair. Well, the fair comes in September. Sorry. If you're just sitting around waiting for the next time it comes around, you're going to be waiting an awful long time. Get up and do something. Leave the pool. God does nothing which doesn't bring him glory. All of creation and all of humanity exists to bring glory to God. And if he's not getting the glory, you're not getting anything. I'm going to say that again. If God is not getting glory, you're not getting anything. If you're happy with the fact that you got to take 20 people out for a steak dinner because he blessed you with a great tax return this year, then your reward is those people saying thanks for dinner. You expand that into the kingdom. If God has healed you, if he has filled you with the power of his spirit, if he has given you the ability to read and understand scripture, if he has given you influence in the, in the people that are around you, if he's given you children that you're supposed to be raising in the kingdom and you're not investing those things back in the kingdom of God, don't come asking for more. If you're not doing something with what you have, I remember one, one time I was speaking in a youth group many, many years ago. I offended some people. I know you're shocked by that. Everybody is surprised that I've offended somebody. And I took my Bible like this, and I said, I said tonight you've gathered to hear this. And we had a very good youth group. They were very excited. I was very supportive. I love those guys. And I took my Bible, and I folded it up, and I threw it as hard as I could over their heads into the back of the room. You probably remember this. <laughs> it hit the back wall and hit the floor with a thud, and there was a mom that was visiting that week with her teenager for the first time. They'd never been to youth group before. And the shock and awe on her face was priceless. We do see things sometimes in our youth where we need to mature and we need to be given some direction. And I'm not advocating this, but I'm saying I did it. But I did it for this reason. Most of us know what's in here already. You don't need more of this. You need to do something with what God gave you. You need to do something with what you know and with what you have that brings God glory. You're wondering, why am I still in a pit of despair? Why am I always broke? Why am I always sick? Why is nothing ever working out for me? Why is my life in shambles? Let me tell you why. What have you done with what God gave you? Because if he's not getting glory, you're not getting more.
If what we like is laying by the pool and just being taken care, for, care of and be, being cared for by other people by, by, by being given what I need, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. If what I'm enjoying is the way people come by and take care of me and my needs, I have declared that I don't need Jesus. If I say I'm, I'm happy with the way people are taking care of me or the way my job is taking care of me or the way my nice house makes me feel comfortable or if I can get everything I need out of life from my welfare check or from my mom and dad that have all the money or from the great empire that I have built for myself by building a business and pulling myself up by my bootstraps, whatever it is you're leaning on, if a man can do it for you, you don't need Jesus. And that's a problem. Look at the comment this man has. Verse 7, Jesus said, verse 6, Jesus, or before that, Jesus says, do, do you want to get well? And the man's response in verse 7 is, I don't have anyone to put me into the pool. I'm accustomed to people doing for me what I need. He did not need a man. He needed the Savior of the world that was standing right in front of him. You don't need some other man or some person or some earthly means of supply to get done what God's asked you to do. There's not enough men and not enough supply to do the work of the Lord already. Even scripture tells us the workers are few. The kingdom needs more people doing something for the kingdom and depending upon God for what they can't do for themselves. The kingdom needs some more people that are actually following aggressively, dangerously after the Lord. Faithfully. There's a song I love. It's got a line in it that says, Faith makes everybody scared, but it's the unknown that keeps me hanging on to you, capital Y, the Lord. It is not easy to do what God's asked you to do. It's not always fun. It's not always enjoyable. It doesn't always make me feel good about myself. But the Lord said, Look, if you're looking to men and you're looking to the things men can provide, you've made it obvious that you don't think you need me. If you're content with the results that mankind can produce, you're not prepared to receive what your God can provide. I'm going to say it one more time, louder for the people in the back. If you're content with the results that mankind can produce, you're not prepared to receive what God can provide. Because he's got something a lot greater than that. In fact, I'm going to say this again. Lord, you've put this in my heart, and I don't know why I keep coming back. <sighs> We've got to stop celebrating the bare minimum. You've stewarded what God gave you well. Awesome. What have you done for the kingdom? What are you doing for the kingdom with what God gave you? We've got churches full of people, households, entire movements of Christians that are just thrilled to death and celebrating that I've done the least that I can for the least of these. It's heartbreaking. There's a part of me that says God must be mad about it. And there's a part of me that says if God's got emotions like I do, he's probably heartbroken. He's probably, I gave these people everything. And they celebrate doing as little as they can with it, if anything at all. I don't have a man to put me in the pool. He didn't need the pool. This man needed the power of God. Don't come to God asking him for what men can do for you. Don't insult or degrade your God by asking him to step down and do a human thing. He is the God of all creation. The resources of heaven are at our disposal if we will come and ask our Father according to his will. How silly and how simple it is to say, Lord, I'd just like a new car. How silly and simple it is to say, Lord, just take care of my human need by some human means that, uh, you know what, never mind, God, I'll just go ask the doctor to help. I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. I'm saying your source is in heaven. Don't insult him. Don't downgrade him. Don't represent him so poorly to the people that are watching you by asking him to just do tiny human things. Don't come to God asking him for what men can do. Come to your God with an expectation that he can and will do something greater than any man can or has ever done in your life. 
And we can start with your life, but this is not self-serving and it's not about you. Once you get over that, let's ask God to do something bigger than any man can do for my family. Then let's ask him to do something bigger than any man can do for my church. Then let's ask him to do something bigger than any man can do for my country and the kingdom of God all over the world. Let's stop asking him for tiny worldly things and let's ask him for something on the level of the God that he is. And when we do that, here's the thing. We've already talked about praying according to his will, and that's important. We have to pray according to the will of God. I can't pray according to mine and expect to get results. My will is broken and nasty and disgusting. I need to pray according to the will of the Lord. When I pray according to the will of God, I also have to come to him knowing this. There is a difference in believing he can and believing he will. My wife and I had this discussion this week about something, and it was about a small thing. It was frustrating to us in the moment. But what came out of that was, yeah, I, I believe God can do that, but I'm not sure I believe he will. We got to know the difference. And here's what the difference is. The difference is expectation. The difference is expectation. The difference in believing he can and believing his will, he will is do I expect it? Romans 8, 19 says this, The creation eagerly awaits with expectation for God's sons to be revealed. This is not just about what I expect from God. This is about me modeling what everything and everyone in the world is looking to the children of God to demonstrate. Creation waits with expectation to see who are the children of God. Who really believes what they say? Who really has this relationship? Who's actually going to step out and do it? Sure, you say that from the pulpit, but would you really do that? Do you really live that way? Do you really believe it? Yes. Sure, you say that when you're in church and you sit in the pew or when you come to the altar, but do you live it when you go to work the next day or when your kids get sick? Do you believe it? Is, is there an expectation? Creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Children of God, where are we? Do we just believe he can, but we're waiting for him to do it over there? Do we believe that he will, and we're expecting it to happen right here where I'm standing? Everyone and everything around you is waiting for you to behave like a child of God so he can be revealed to, to them through you. We can say we believe all day, and we've even heard. We've seen it in other places, and we've heard it from other places. We've read it in the Bible. We know he's going to do what he said do. But we've at some point got to exercise some expectation in our own lives. At some point, we've got to cross over from saying he can do it for other people and believe that he can do it for me and that he can do it for my church and my children and my wife and my community and the kingdom of God where I live. It's not just something that happens in other places. And the difference in that is you. Do you expect him to do it? Or do you just believe that he did and maybe he will again if he feels like it one day? We've got to expect. I'm asking you this morning, do you actually believe that he can do what he says he can do? Do you have an expectation that he will? Or is it just a neat idea? You've got to expect him to do what he said. In fact, you've got to have some holy expectation of him before he will ever do all that he said in and through you that he said he could do. He's made you some promises and some of you were sitting around waiting for them to come to, pla- come to pass. He's waiting for you to stand up and act like the child that he ordained to get some stuff done. We don't come before the Lord with an entitled attitude that God, you said you would, so you better. That's, an, that's a heart problem. That's an attitude problem. But I have to come before the Lord with expectation. Lord, you said you would, and I believe it, and I'm waiting for it right now. Expectation is not entitlement, but we've got to expect him to do it. James 2, 17. It says, faith without works is dead. Belief without expectation is no better because my behavior shows what I believe. I can say all day what I think. If I truly have faith, I'm going to go and do according to my faith. If I truly have an expectation, I'm going to do what I say I believe. Believing without corresponding behavior, you might as well be wishing for something. By your little well and your little pool in the ground, surrounded by your friends that are encouraging you not to leave. 
when the Lord says, do you want to get well? You need to know what you're asking, and you've got to respond with some expectation. The Lord doesn't ask his questions for no reasons. If he's asking you, are you ready to get well? It's because he's ready to dispense something. And it's not just going to be the miracle you need. It's going to be a commission to do the work. Do you want to get well? If you're not prepared to move, don't expect God to manifest a miracle. Jesus said, get up and walk. He didn't just say, get up. He didn't just say, get up. He said, get up and walk. I've taught you enough and we've preached enough in here. When we see walk in Scripture, particularly when we see it in the New Testament, we're talking about not just this. It's not just foot in front of the other. When we're talking in the New Testament, when we see the word walk, that's the word we use to describe the way we live our life. My walk with Christ. Am I walking with Him? This is not just a question of my leg's broken, I need someone to put the bone back together. This is a question of am I going to walk, am I going to run, am I going to climb, am I going to do what needs to be done? Am I going to live the lifestyle of a healed person when God comes to heal me? If you're not prepared to move when God moves on you, don't bother with just an apology and say, oh Lord, I'm sorry. Sorry I sinned. Forgive me. Because repenting is the movement, that's the act of walking away. If you're not prepared to move, don't ask God to heal you if you're just planning to sit there around the sick people and continue to enjoy the benefits that sick people get because you think that's easier than stepping out and going where God asks you to go and doing something with your healed and whole body that's been provided for by the power of the Spirit of God that's filled and called and commissioned to do, to do His work. Don't bother praying for what you've already purposed in your heart you're not going to do. Don't send me to minister to people, Lord. Don't send me to talk to that group. Don't make me be friendly with them. Don't make me read scripture every single day. Don't make me go through that begat, who begat, who begat in the Old Testament. I don't want to have to read it all. It's okay, you can laugh. That's a hard part to read. Don't make me be around sick people. Don't make me have to be around people that will speak ill of me. Don't make me have to die for what I believe. Don't ask the Lord to do for you what you've already purposed in your heart you won't do. If, he's a, if you're asking him to heal you, he's going to say, he, he will heal you. Get up. And then he's going to say, walk it out. And then you're going to get hit and he's going to say, walk it off. Keep walking. Keep walking. But you won't knock down our wall. Veggie tails, anybody, right? <laughs> if you're not prepared to move, don't pray. Don't ask. Every single time that God manifests a miracle in Scripture, movement is required. Jesus never once said, stay right here, I'm going to send some folks back to take care of you. It's not in there. Yes, you can find some times when Jesus said, okay, stay and wait for me. That's a completely different story because that's obedience. That's actively waiting because God said wait. But he didn't say be healed and then hang out here because I'm going to send somebody every day to keep feeding you. He didn't say be healed and sit here and not do anything. He didn't say be saved and just hang out till I get back. I got this. Me and the apostles are going to do all the work. Not once did he say, stay right here and I'll send some people to continue maintaining your lifestyle for you that's made you comfortable. That's what mankind did for you and I want to do something so much greater. You've got to come on. Look at some of the miracles. This one, pick up your mat and walk. Feed 5,000 people. Now, go get some baskets, fill them up, carry them with us. Peter, you see me out here walking. Come on out of the boat if you want to come. Lazarus, I know you were dead. I know you're awake in there now. Come out. Don't hang out where the dead are. I've called you out of that. I picked you up from that. Get up and walk. Come out of the tomb. And when you come out, go and sin no more. 
And when you're going and sinning no more, go into all the world and declare the gospel, preaching and teaching and baptizing in my name. Every single time God performs a miracle, whether it's healing the sick or raising the dead or providing salvation and grace, the very next thing is go and do. Pick up your mat and walk. We got to move on from where we are or there will be no miracles and no power. If what this man likes is the company of the sick people, then he's not going to leave their company. By all means, invite the sick people to come with you. The Lord healed me. How about he will do the same for you? Let's pray. How about if he doesn't miraculously heal you, he will provide for you you in some other way. And you don't have to stay here dwelling among the sick and the broken because God will make a way and there will be power for a miracle for you that may or may not look like mine, but it will certainly empower you to do the work God called you to do if you say, yes, I will. Invite them to come with you. I don't mean leave them behind and distance yourself and cut yourself off. I don't mean that you have to separate yourself to the point that there's no conversation with them anymore. We live in the world, but we're not of it. I don't have to act like you where my heart and my spirit are concerned. That's a whole different message. But I can be among you with my heart and spirit in right standing with the Lord, making sure that like that verse we just read, people can see what the children of God look like and I can lead you somewhere else. Invite them to come with you. Encourage those people not to live there. Check on them from time to time to see if they're following along. That's called evangelism. You don't have to be the traveling preacher with a tent. You have to be a person with the spirit of God in his heart that says, I don't want to see you burn and die. So I remember what it was like to lay here where you are. We don't have to stay here. That's evangelism. But you don't live there and hang out among them in that same way that you once did because you're not one of them anymore. And whether they move on or not, you've still got to go where you're called. Well, Lord, I'll leave this place if you can get two or three of these other people saved. Well, if he didn't tell you to stay there and get two or three more people saved, you're in rebellion. That's sin. Now you've got repentance you've got to work through. And when you're done with that, you've got the weight of the fact that you think you let God down and you still got to keep walking. Because the call isn't getting lifted from you. It remains regardless. You're just deciding how hard you want to make it to do the work of the Lord by deciding how much sin you're going to have to work through and how many stories people can come back and tell on you later when you are doing the work. Move on from where you're at. And whether the people that you've been around move with you or not doesn't matter. You've got to come when you're called. And you've got to know that when you leave, you're going to have some detractors. You've got some friends that are going to say, hey, we hate to see you go. Don't go. What are you going to do out there? It's scary. We don't know it. Faith is a myth. Jesus is a story. You've got it good here. Don't go do that. That's what crazy people do. Well-meaning friends that will say, don't leave the pool. We have everything here that we need. And what what if you need a miracle again later and you're not by the water? Water's in me. Spirit is in me. I've got to go where Jesus said go or the water in that pool isn't any good for me anymore. Some of the people that want you to stay are going to be your friends. Some of the people that are going to give you a hard time are the people that will see you go. Verse 10, the Jews... Oh my, God's chosen people crucifying and beating to death those who have been healed and are trying to move on and follow the Lord. Don't do that. The Jews said to the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath. It's illegal for you to pick up your mat. (laughs) Christians begging other Christians not to follow the Lord telling them that the way they're following the Lord is wrong because it doesn't look like the way they think the Lord should be followed. There's a whole army of Christians out there that want to tell you you're doing it wrong. You're not even saved. You don't look saved. You don't smell saved. You don't act saved. And now the way that you're preaching is not saved. And the way you're living your life is not saved. And the way you're ministering to people is not saved. And the people that you've prayed for probably aren't even saved because they came to you and you're wrong. Legalistic people, law bearers. 
those that want to observe that old law. Here's what's interesting about this. Jesus said, pick up your mat and walk. Picking up the mat on the Sabbath was not even the problem. It wasn't that he rolled up his mat and lifted it and got up off the ground. There was no Sabbath code in Scripture that says you can't pick up your bed. Okay? This was a what's called a rabbinical code. It was something the priests and the Levites and the rabbis had decided, and it wasn't about picking up the mat. Here's what they were mad about. The code prohibits carrying something from one place to another. Let me apply that for you real quick so you can see how absurd this is. The keepers of the law who were supposed to be God's chosen people to, lay, to stand over all of the others and say, here's how we apply the law. They took something that was not even a biblical law. It was their personal law. And they applied it to a healed man that had been touched by Jesus and said, it's against the law for you to leave the place of sickness and go to where you will be well and effective. They made their own law that said, you can't leave the pool. They didn't make it that day. It had been around for a while, but that's the problem. They're essentially looking at him from a spiritual perspective and saying, it's illegal for you to leave this place and go to where God called you. Sounds a whole lot like people saying, you're not worshiping the Lord right. You can't sing that song in church. You can't use those instruments in church. The person that is the preacher at that church where that songwriter wrote that song is a heretic, so we can't worship to it anymore. Oh my gosh, Lord, help me. We got to stop cancel culture theology in the church. We got to stop arguing over things that don't matter. We're just as quick to look at people and say, you don't believe what I believe, so we can't have anything to do with you or anything else that happens. Can we agree that Jesus is the Son of God? Can we believe that we're saved by grace? Can we believe that the people who are not in relationship with him are out there dying and going to hell? Why are we having arguments about whether or not we should save them? Why are we having arguments or not about how we worship the Lord when at the end of the day, at the end of the age, what matters is do you know Jesus and does Jesus know you? I would love to cancel, cancel culture theology. <laughs> This was a law that people had devised. It was not even a law of God. And it says, you've got no right to leave this place where you are broken and hurt and dependent upon men and step into a place where God provides for you. That's just dumb. I don't even have any nice, fancy words for that. It's just dumb. It's ignorant. It's backwards. Can I use this word? It's heresy to say that you're not allowed to follow the Lord. Your friends want you to stay. Your enemies try to say that you can't leave. You have got to know the voice of your Savior so you can follow through. What did God say? This man knew it. I love this response. It's probably my favorite answer to a detractor anywhere in the Bible. I've, there's some great speeches that Peter and Paul gave, some great messages that they preached. But here's what happened. When the friends and the legalists came for the man who had been healed, verse 11 says, the healed man looked at them and says, the man who healed me told me to walk. The man who healed me told me to leave this place. I don't care what good friends we've been and you don't want me to leave. I don't care what law you've made up that says I can't worship the way the Lord's called me. I know the Savior's voice. The man that healed me said to walk and I'm going to keep walking. All that matters in your life is the commission of Christ. You've got to leave your pool of Bethesda. Stand up with me this morning. You've got to leave the pool. You can't stay there anymore. We're called to live among the sick, but we're not called to behave like the sick anymore because we have known the healer. We're called to live among the hurt, but we're not supposed to keep living like we're hurt, broken people because we have met and experienced the one who restored us. We're called to live among the good people of the world but not to be content with their good works because we know the only one who is good. This morning, 
Those of you that call yourself Christians, this is the call of the Lord to you. Leave the pool and partake of the power and take up the cause of Christ this morning in your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you today for this message, for the chance to gather here with your people. I thank you for the work that you're doing in this church and in the hearts of those that you have gathered. I thank you that we've heard your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would convict those that need to be convicted, that you would empower those that need to be empowered, that you would forgive those that need to be forgiven, and, Lord, that you would propel us, compel us, Lord, to walk and move forward in what we have heard and what we have learned from you this morning. Let us put it to good use in our own life and into the life of everyone that we meet so that no one around us will question where are the sons and daughters of God. They'll look at us and say, he's right there, she's right there, there they are, they're in that place, they've shown up, God is here and God is real. God, I believe for your power to be poured out in this place. I believe it to be poured out in the lives of your people. I believe you're preparing us for something tremendous in this church, and I believe you're preparing the kingdom for something tremendous on the earth and the age in which we live. This morning, Lord, we come to you as a church and as a people, and we repent for the places where we have gotten up but not walked, and we purpose in our heart to walk away from the pool. Thank you for your healing, for your grace, for the ministry that you have provided to us. Thank you for the calling that you've given us. And thank you for the opportunity to walk it out and effectively do something for you. We're humbled and we're honored, Lord. Be with us as we go. Keep us safe and in your presence in all that we do until we gather back here in your name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming this morning.